antiquity and video games. They seem like an unlikely pair. But video games have always had a fruitful relationship with antiquity, from the earliest computer games to the latest blockbusters. In such games, the histories and cultures of Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece and Rome are used as fun places to play with and discover the past. More than that, games set in antiquity have actually given us revolutionary innovations in games. Yes, and games also let us play around with our own stereotypes and give us new ways to experience classical antiquity. In this series of videos, we will take you through some of the biggest game changers set in antiquity, and we will discuss how they revolutionized game history and our understanding of the past. I am Arisimir Politopoulos. And I am Angus Dr. Random Moll. And we're both archaeologists and game scholars who study how we play with the past. So, settle into your time machine seats. And let's dig in to the past. Angus, what are we even looking at here? We are looking at Hammurabi. So, it's playing currently on an old Commodore 64. And this is a really old, well, by our standards anyway, really old text-based game from the 70s. It actually comes from one of the most popular computer books ever. It's called Basic Computer Games, or Creating Computer Games with Basic. Basic was a, a computer language, a uh, programming language from the 70s and even a little bit older. A lot of people learned how to program with this book. And a lot of people played Hammurabi as a result. But actually, this history is getting to be even more interesting because Hammurabi as a game is even older. So how old is it? <laughs> I'm not to lean any further. It is pretty old. It is one of the first uh, games uh, that were playable uh, on, on computers, but not any, just any computer. We're talking 1964, 1966. And Hammurabi was then called the Sumer game. And it was part of a big experiment set up by John Hopkins University uh, together in collaboration with a lot of people that were interested in how can we learn with what at that time was this completely new thing, right? Computers. And what they did was they went to a school in America called the Lexington High. I don't know how they selected uh, because it wasn't Unclear. like people, people knew by, back then how cool games were. I mean, probably like playground games, yeah. but not computer games, right? They selected a bunch, uh, I guess, randomly of kids about 12 to 14, it's not entirely clear from the data set, and they let them play this game. Well, don't expect that they were just in front of a nice big widescreen television. No, they were actually playing this game by typing commands into a teleprompter, mm -hmm. uh, an IBM 1050 terminal, a very sort of, you can think of it as a, as a sort of a fax machine that was making connections with an IBM mainframe computer somewhere else for which you had rented space. And basically they were typing things in like, um, this is what I do now, and this is what I do now. And they were trying, they were asked, these kids, to imagine that they were the rulers, the priest kings of an ancient uh, um, city mm -hmm. called Lagash, and they were playing Luduga 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so both Hammurabi and Lagash, these should be terms that are familiar to you, not to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. So... This is very interesting because it's not the kind of history that we often see in games. So when we're talking about the city of Lagash, we're talking about one of these ancient city-states of southern Mesopotamia, right? So city of Lagash existed already in the third millennium BC, and it has gone through all sorts of uh, highs and lows during the third millennium BC, from the early dynastic period to the Sargonic period, uh, and then into the Ur-3 period when it was again a really big and important city. Pretty old stuff then. Pretty old stuff. We're talking about 3000 BC until 2000 BC, more or less, maybe a bit older, maybe a bit later as well. Yeah. Um, and it was one of the important cities of southern Mesopotamia. At the same time, Hammurabi, uh, maybe a name that people are more familiar with, mm -hmm. um, especially from the stele of Hammurabi or the laws of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was the king of Babylon, not in the 3rd millennium BC, but in the beginning of the 2nd millennium BC. So his reign dates to somewhere around 1810 BC to 1750 BC. Um, and as I've said, most of you probably know him from the Code of Hammurabi or the Laws of Hammurabi. Uh, he said that they were bestowed upon him from the deity Shamas. Mm -hmm. um, it was also the uh, favorite of Marduk, who is the patron deity of the city of Babylon. 
one of the things that are very interesting from in regards to these laws is that for the first time we see a big focus on the punishment of the perpetrator. Interesting, I think, that there's a connection to be made here between codes and coding, yes, right? Absolutely. Which was what this game was meant to do. Uh, at the same time, this game was also meant to do something else because we know from the uh, scholars who actually conducted this experiment that the immediate reason, this is a quote, the immediate reason for the choice of the Sumerians was to protest against the growing tendencies in school curricula to ignore the pre-Greek civilizations, in spite of the then growing weight of the scholarly evidence as to the important role which is prehistory and early history um, should be playing in our in our understanding of these processes by which our society has come to be what it is. End quote. Um, one of the things that you can see in this game um, is that agriculture, especially in the later one, Hammurabi, mm -hmm. and food, plays a big role. Well, what yeah. about that? Well, for a very long time, and I mean still today, we, we have a good understanding of the importance of agriculture for Mesopotamian societies. We're talking about a period where we have the so-called first cities of the world, um, and irrigation and agriculture and managing surpluses of agri uh, agriculture was of particular importance. Mm -hmm. In the past, our theories were focused much more in agriculture. Nowadays, we have a more nuanced under understanding. So no agricultural revolution anymore? No real agricultural revolution. Okay, okay. No. Uh, also no real urban revolution. But uh, no? No. What, but what happened to all the revolutions? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are having them right now. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but agriculture is very important, was very important for these societies as well, and managing surpluses and the administration of agricultural surpluses was very important back then, as it is in the game as well. Yeah, one of the things that they try to do with this game is they try to teach kids economy, yeah. and they just used history. What turned out, and it's actually, uh, uh, still in the reports, that kids love the history aspect of this much more than they like the economy aspect of it. And that's not so strange, because this really had a, a narrative to this. And mm -hmm. this is, in fact, also one of the revolutionary things of Hammurabi, or, in fact, of the Sumer game. Because it is also, according to research done by Kate Willard, one of the first, maybe the first, game, computer game, with a narrative. It was actually written by a school teacher there, uh, called Mabel Addis, who was, in fact, the first game writer. And mm -hmm. she was typing everything out and not coding yeah. things, right? Not in that sense, software writing, but story writing for games. And I think one of the interesting things is here that this game absolutely inspired a lot of early game developers, including one that we're going to be looking at after this one. Let's go. Okay. So, we talked about a game taking place at the dawn of civilization. But I got a little question for you. Mm -hmm. What is civilization? Well, that's a very good question. And that's a question that many archaeologists and historians, political scientists, they have been asking for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Civilization is one of these words that we use very often, that we generally have, we think that we have an understanding. But what is the precise definition of civilization? You tell me. It's very hard to say, actually. You tell me. <laughs> So civilization, the word itself, is based on the concept of cities, right? Civilis, civilis, and civilization stems from the idea of the city um, and of being a citizen. Mm -hmm. So having a city and being a citizen is core for the idea of civilization. And the same holds true for many other versions of this word from different languages, for example, in Greek, we say politismos, which comes from the word polis, once again, the city, right? Medienet in Arabic also stems from Medina, Dutch, the city. Dutch as beschaving, well. I don't think there's any city in it, but maybe that's the rule. I will one. leave this up to, to, <laughs> to the, the Dutch. Yeah. Um, but so, what is civilization? Is civilization only something that has to do with cities? Did humans have civilization before that? Um, it's... Not that it's very hard to say, but it's more that it gives a certain perspective on history. So, right. so, so, so civilization is cities, and cities are other things then as well? Cities then can be states, right? Cities mean organization, cities mean administration. Mm. And oftentimes, in our general understanding, cities, cities mean governments, structured societies and hierarchies, complex societies. All these are terms that are very loaded, and have concerned archaeologists for a long time. And there is a big debate. Is this actually the case? 
when we're talking about civilization, do we only need to talk about cities? Is this an exclusionary understanding of history? Yes or no? It is a very complex topic, as you can see, that has a lot of discussion in it. Okay. But (laughs) in the early 1990s, um, some people solved it. They solved it. They solved it. So, legendary game developer Sid Meier, together with Bruce uh, Shelley, they said, you know what? We figured it out. We're going to make a game about civilization. And they made Sid Meier's Civilization. And it was pretty popular, right? It was extremely popular. So you could say that basically a bunch of game developers solved the complex problem of civilization and where we come from. That's That feels like a game changer to me, right? I mean, in a way, it was a very big game changer. Of course, they didn't solve the philosophical or the academic issue. They actually created yet another angle through which we can study the concept of civilization okay. or through which we can see what people understand when it comes to the concept of civilization. We've been doing a lot of this secretly, right? We've been playing a lot of this game. Maybe some hundreds of hours. (laughs) Yes, maybe. (laughs) Um, But so, maybe you're wondering, okay, what is civilization? The The game, game, not (laughs) the term. (laughs) So, civilization is uh, a strategy game. Uh, You play as the leader of one of the world civilizations, Right? You can play as the Netherlands, you can play as ancient Greece. We are one of the world civilizations. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, but also you can play as China, you can play as Brazil, you can play as Australia. Can you, you, play, can as, can you play as the Sumerians? You can actually play as Sumerians, oh, yes. Cool. And then your leader is Gilgamesh. So <clears throat> you choose this leader, you choose your civilization, and you try to lead your civilization from the dawn of history at 4000 BC, that is what is conceived in the game, the dawn of history, and into the future. So you go all the way from 4000 BC, you can go all the way as far as you want into the future, and what you're trying to do is you're competing against other civilizations for resources, Mm -hmm. for territory, uh, and for fame and glory as well, (laughs) and you try to win through different means. You can either win in the game by war and dominating all or uh, all other civilizations or you can win through cultural means by amassing many tourists apparently okay through diplomacy That's culture for you yeah. <laughs> you can also win by winning the space race which is very much a cold war remnant um, so there are different ways of leading your civilization into the future and making it the most dominant civilization in the, in the world you know the more you talk about this game secretly i think <coughs> This is a game just like Hammurabi or just like the Sumer game, that it's secretly an educational game. Or is it just actually an educational game? Well, yes and no. Sid Meier never wanted this game to be an educational game. Uh, He made it to be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, But he also said that this was the dirty little secret about civilization and about games in general, that you actually learn something from them. And actually they've implemented a lot of stuff in the game through which you can learn. A good example of this is the Civilopedia, mm-hmm. because you, you know, build cities, you build units and stuff, and you can open the Civilopedia, which is the encyclopedia of the game, and it gives you some information about these units or characteristics of the game or civilizations and so on. Now, when Sid Meier was first making this game, back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, there, there was no real internet out there with Wikipedia and all the kind of resources that <laughs> yes, you can imagine. Sure. So he was um, a bit stuck, let's say, with this. The Macmillan World History <laughs> Fact Finder. Um, and he based most of the history... All facts, no, no fake news in here. No fake news, all facts. Um, he based a lot of the understandings of history that go into the first civilization onto this book. Now, this book is... Is not written by um, a historian. No, no, an archaeologist. Then no, it's no? actually written by a medical doctor. Oh, <laughs> who was very passionate about history and okay. and published uh, a little book uh, about it. It's not very little. It's actually pretty big, mm-hmm. but that also means that this book has very particular views and angles towards history. Okay, and these are often mirrored directly into the game. So, tell me a bit more about those particular angles then. So. One of the things um, that are very clear from the game and from this book is that they see history as very euphemistic. Mm -hmm. And by euphemistic, I mean that it understands history as positive progress always. So we start from 
bands and tribes that yeah. struggle to survive in in the world and we go into cities and states and big civilizations and into today. Yeah, so we, we even end up with the innovation of social media, right? Exactly. So what, what's wrong with that? <laughs> it's not that there is something necessarily wrong, mm-hmm. but it's something when it comes to understandings of history that can be exclusionary. Okay. Just as is the case with the game of civilization where you always get to play as one leader. Um, and the history is the history of the leader. In civilization, you never get to interact or see your citizens. They're often portrayed just as numbers in your cities that you have to manage. So in this way, it's a very exclusionary history. It's the history of big men or big women in some cases because you can play with leaders that are Of VIPs in history. Exactly. It's indeed the history of the VIPs and it's not the history of the people, which in a way it's not particularly revolutionary because these are the histories that we've been learning all the time. So basically, it's a little bit like you're an autograd throughout the entirety of history. Actually, yes, because even if in a game of civilization you get to choose your government, um, in reality, you, the leader, are always in control and always having absolute power over your subjects. I mean, I don't necessarily want to be a dictator or an autocrat, but I do like being in control. And I will say for sure that Sif is... A lot of fun. Sid is definitely a lot of fun. And Sid Meier knew this, right? And interestingly, contrary to what we just discussed, he also argued that he didn't want to project um, his own or their own as the group of developers political philosophy onto the game because uh, he argued that played, playing out someone else's political philosophy is not really fun for the player. I think... Sorry, Sid, I think that's wrong because one of the things that I always liked about the very first time that I played Civilization was that there was a history in it. It was, in fact, the history of the VIPs, right? Yes. And the important people, the important religions, the the important stuff, right? Yeah. And with that, you got to remix that. But if you don't have a story or a view of things, you don't get to do the remixing, right? You don't get to make your own history. So you, you kind of need that philosophy of history And also, let's be real, if you're talking about civilization, it seems like a big topic. It's very difficult to not have any ideas about it, right? Exactly. It is very difficult. And just as we discussed, and there's, of course, a lot more to discuss, there is there are a lot of politics, and there's a lot of political philosophy projected on the civ, a lot of particular views that have their pros, but also have their cons. Yeah. And that's why this game is so very important, among other things. What is the other reason? I think the other reason is particularly fun, right? Yeah. And it's been played a whole of a lot. It has been played a whole of a lot. So the developer said at some point for Civilization 5, currently we're in Civilization 6, waiting for 7, but for Civilization 5, they said that between 2010 and 2016, uh, people have spent over 1.2 billion hours playing Civilization 5. Now that is an impressive amount of hours. <laughs> that is an impressive amount of hours. That also is the same as the collective humanity has spent in the same time frame visiting the six largest heritage museums of the world. Okay. (laughs) So people have spent more time playing and experiencing history and the past through civilization than visiting museums like the Louvre or the... Or the RMO, let's be real here. Or the RMO for that (laughs) matter, yes. So um, to cap, to recap this... So they cracked civilization as a simulation. They uh, also maybe (coughs) did a very good run at teaching through fun. Um, And they've got very impressive visitors numbers, this particular uh, particular game developers. We can talk about a game changer here. It is an absolute game changer. And many, many strategy games stemmed from that particular game. So yes, it's definitely a game changer. But not only strategy games, in the sense that, that playing with the past also happened in a lot of others. Let's check some more. Let's check some more. Wait a minute. This is not about antiquity. This is the Middle Ages. Yeah, for sure. But this trailer for the very first Assassin's Creed set during the Crusade still gives me goosebumps. Okay, why? Tell me more about this. So in 2007, when the first game, game came out, Assassin's Creed, the series, was really... Uh, a, a huge, huge proposition, right? It was about you playing with the past, not as from a distance, as for example in Sid Meier's Civilization, 
or in other ways. No, you would really be there, right? You would enter that time machine. Since then, we've got 12 main games with several spin-offs, and every game takes you to another uh, place and another past as well. So we visited, up absolutely, we visited um, the Holy Land, quote-unquote, right? As yeah. seen from the Crusaders who were invading mm -hmm. it. Uh, we've seen... Um, the in industrial London, we've seen the American Revolution, we've seen so many places that our mind, mind likes to wander to. We've also seen Ptolemaic Egypt. This is actually very exciting for me. And it was very no, God, this, is, this is where it gets exciting for this you. This is where it gets exciting for me. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, and it was where it got exciting because I was not a really big fan of Assassin's Creed no. uh, before, for ugly reasons. Um, but it started going into classical antiquity, and that got me a little bit more excited. So here we're actually in the Ptolemaic Egypt. And when we're talking about the Ptolemaic Egypt, we are talking roughly about 305 BC with Ptolemy I, a good friend of Alexander the Great, um, up until around 30 BC and the death of uh, Cleopatra. I know that name. Absolutely. You know this name probably from very many places. In this particular game, we are um, at, let's say, 49 BC until 43 BC. That's what the game tells us, right? So we are really at the end of the Ptolemaic period and the end of the reign of uh, Cleopatra. What is uh, particularly interesting about this, for me at least, is that oftentimes when we're thinking about Cleopatra and we're thinking about the end of that particular period of Egypt, we are mainly talking about the Romans. Mm -hmm. But in this game, we actually get to play in Egypt and we are actually talking about Egypt and much less about how the Romans invaded Egypt. Yeah, spoilers. Well, I'm not going to spoil anything here. Towards the end game, it gets to be a little bit more about the Romans. That said, you're following throughout this game, you're following the story of Bajek. Mm -hmm. of, um, I forgot the, the original place where he came from. Um, but you're following him basically through... Uh, a very uh, sort of exciting conspiracy story throughout all of Egypt. And that's another one of the major selling points mm -hmm. for this game in terms of the Assassin's Creed series. It, uh, it has this huge, and I do mean huge, open world. There's almost not a place in Egypt that you can visit nowadays in terms of the highlights yeah. of history, right, that is not in there. And that you can not only visit, but you can climb on top of it. There's stuff happening in between it, right? Obviously, you get to go to Alexandria during this time, a very important town, right? But you also get to go to old Memphis. You also mm -hmm. get to go to uh, Karnak, the Valley of Kings. Obviously, you get to climb on top of pyramids because that's what playing with the past is all about, right? Of course. But what is also very, very interesting is that by the time of the Ptolemaic Egypt, the pyramids were already very old. We're talking about two and a half thousand years old. That is, that is pretty cool. And that's also why I like to refer to these things as playful time machines, right? Because you get to go back in time and all of a sudden you understand mm -hmm. how old the world already yeah. was back then. Okay, but we're talking about all these places, but how accurate is this game actually? That's a great question that I'm not really, you know, because I'm not an Egyptologist, I can answer. But I'll just work with it a little bit. One of the ways to think about this game is not about how accurate it is, it is about how authentic it feels. Mm -hmm. So that's, of course, something that game makers are really focusing on. How does it feel? How can you really be immersed yeah. in Ptolemaic Egypt, right? The reality for that is, if you want to do a good job of that, and I do think in many ways these developers at Ubisoft have done a great job, you do need a lot of knowledge, you do need a lot of facts about yeah. the past, right? I've once talked with Maxime Durand, who is the staff historian of Ubisoft, who told me that one of the game developers quite more or less written a whole thesis, a 60-page document, oh, wow. not just on Egypt, no, on how Egyptian quarries work. Okay, that is very interesting. So uh, can we talk about Assassin's Creed as a game changer? I think the very first one, yes, for sure. And then with every single game, we've seen incremental changes, right? Such as with, with Assassin's Creed uh, Origins. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that is happening in this game as well, which was also a game changer for this particular one, mm -hmm. is that they put the Discovery Tour in there, which mm -hmm. I think is really neat because it's a stand-aside game mode that even if you're not really into games, especially games where you play an Assassin, right? You still get to experience what these developers created. So we do have some changes, especially with, with well, especially with the first one. We have some changes now, but maybe not that many. I mean, the reality of, of things are that some things feel revolutionary, as this trailer did to mm -hmm. me in 2007. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes revolutions don't go anywhere. And this is the sad reality of revolutions. Not all of them 
always work. But what is for sure real is that we're going to a next game. A next game. Are you excited? Yes, yes. I'm very excited. I'm very excited because now we get to talk about one of my most favorite games of all time. Okay, then let's descend into Hades. All right, all right, great. So, Hades, what is Hades? Hades is a roguelike game where you get to escape. Well, Hades. What is a, don't talk gamer to me. All right. Talk, talk normal. What is a roguelike game? A roguelike game is a very interesting genre of games okay. where instead of having a very long game where you have to go through various levels, mm-hmm. there is... Like Assassin's Creed, for like example. Like Assassin's Creed, for example, indeed. You get to have a very limited set of levels mm-hmm. that are increasingly harder and that you have to manage to finish in one go without dying, basically. So you don't get to have extra lives like Super Mario, where you can die and start again. Mm -hmm. No, you really have to start again from the beginning. You lose your progress every time. That sounds a little bit daunting and a little bit difficult, but that's part of the charm of roguelike games. So uh, what is this roguelike about then? Hades. Dying (laughs) and Hades, I can see. Yes, Yes. but how does it work? So you play as Mm -hmm. Zagreus. So, who the Hades is Zagreus. <laughs> okay, I don't know that name. A lot of questions, yes. but Zagreus, well, actually, you don't know, and we don't exactly know in general. Uh, Zagreus is a mythological figure from ancient Greece <coughs> that enters the mythology a bit late, uh, also with Orphic myths. It's not clear if it's indeed the uh, son of Hades in some mythological versions he is. In some others, he is the uh, son of Zeus and Persephone. So again, we do have some uh, Hades in there with Persephone, but we don't really exactly know. So this game is basically about a nobody in terms of mythological, archaeological terms? Do we, do we, do we, I mean, come on, do we get to meet anyone famous in this game? We actually do. We actually get to meet most of the famous people. We get to meet Zeus, we get to meet Hades, of course, we get to meet Poseidon, we get to meet a bunch of the major Hades. The the three-headed doggy? Uh, Cerberus, of course, we are in Hades. You get to pet Cerberus. You get to pet pet Cerberus (laughs) as well. You meet Achilles, uh, you meet Patroclus, you meet Sleep. You meet. I'm oh, sorry, you were talking about sleep. That's um, not actually why I'm yawning. I'm sorry. It, <coughs> I, I don't want to be mean here, but Greek mythology and all these heroes, I've been hearing these stories since I was very young already, right? Yeah. So, how is this revolutionary? Actually, Hades is very revolutionary, both as a game and in gaming terms, but also in terms of the Greek mythology. So, what Hades uh, does very well is that it well, what it did, first of all, is it revitalized the roguelike genre. Okay. There were still roguelike games being made, but um, there weren't that very many. Um, and what it did that was particularly new is that it introduced a core central story. Right. Usually these games are about repetition, and of course Hades is also about repetition, but there's a lot of progress in it in terms of narrative and story. There's a lot of dialogue. You get to talk and interact with a lot of people all through this challenge of going over and over this particular task to try to escape yeah, Hades. I can see if you're sort of caught in Hades, that is definitely, it's fitting, right? It is very fitting. It's also very playful. Hades, you try to escape and of course Hades knows you're going to fail because it's very hard to oh, escape Wait, your Hades. dad is preventing you. Your dad is actually preventing you <laughs> because you are, and that's the other thing. So it's, it's also Freudian <laughs> then, I guess. <laughs> that's the other part of why this game is so revolutionary. It's because it brings a completely new and fresh take into Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. It's not about how great the gods are and all the great deeds that the the, the gods have done, but it's actually about the difficulties. It's a coming of age story. You're playing a Sagreus who is a late teenager who struggles with all the same issues that late teenagers struggle with. Problems with his dad, problems with his mom, but also problems with uncles, all the gods, right? And some some, (coughs) some relationship troubles. Some relationship troubles. Um, But there's also a lot of diversity and uh, inclusivity going on into this game. We have a lot of representation. Uh, And overall, it has a very, an overarching, very rich and beautiful story. But it's not the kind of story that comes directly from the ancient Greeks. It's actually a new telling of a new story uh, of Greek mythology. But that doesn't make it feel 
unreal in a mm. way. Mm. It actually makes it feel even more mythological. And epic as well, right? <laughs> Very epic. Especially yeah. if you spend 120 hours like me playing this game. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> so you've played this game a long time. I've also played this yes. game. Who are your favorite gods in this game? Well, maybe somebody would expect to be Aris because that's my name, but it is actually not. I think one of the, my most favorite gods in this game is Athena. Uh, she, I really like the illustration of Athena. The game has some beautiful art, as you can see on the screen. Um, and Athena is portrayed as a person of color, based on the Book of Black Athena as well. The kind of character that she has really reflects... Black Athena, explain that one for viewers. Okay, so the concept of Black Athena uh, is based on a book that was published in the 80s that talks about the Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilization. Now, as a book and as a concept, this has been heavily criticized mm -hmm. by scholars. But one of the things that games do very well is that they open up this creative space yeah. for you to introduce new ideas <coughs> or to experiment with new ideas. And here, actually, Black Athena really works. And also, Athena works as a character. Uh, they've uh, incorporated all the traits of Athena that we know uh, from classical mythology. But also, the kind of powers that she gives you are also really neat in the game. So, um, to keep with the theme of this particular video series, you know what my favorite character in here Benjamin. is? Chaos. Oh, of course. <laughs> All right. You know what also was chaos? Sometimes. The game we're going to talk about next time. All right. Okay. This one I know. Yeah. I think most everyone will know this one because this is Minecraft. And this is not just any Minecraft, this is Rome Minecraft. Romanen, Romans, and Minecraft. That was a great pun in Dutch. Doesn't really work in English, but you gotta roll with the language you have, right? No, exactly. So we did this together. We did this together and with the Value Foundation and as part of the Value Foundation, uh, we visited a bunch of museums and galleries between 2017 and 2019 to build a bunch of stuff. And we did that with more than 500 people building and more than 2,000 participants coming to see what it is that we're doing. So, what it is that we're doing. Uh, we didn't build stuff in the museum, or at least we did, but we did it on computers, right? We built yep. in Minecraft. So we had this, these maps that we created ourselves of uh, the Roman Netherlands in mm -hmm. 150 AD, particularly of the Limes, so the border region. And uh, basically what we said to ourselves and to a bunch of people that wanted to play along, Let's remake what this border region would have looked like. Mm -hmm. um, but let's use Minecraft for that. And that me meant we were just plunking down a bunch of computers, asking people to play along with us. And we got to see some very wild things. Uh, in terms, We also got built some beautiful things, mm -hmm. like the biggest building, the Principia, biggest building of the Netherlands in that time, the Principia yeah. of Nijmegen. Uh, we also built a lot of silly things, which was also a good part of it. Like a bunch of roller coasters. <laughs> Absolutely. But okay, so how is this a game changer? Well, that is in a way the answer, right? Because oftentimes when we uh, uh, <coughs> sort of work with the past, especially as you know, people that are serious about the past, like archaeologists, but also just people in general, you're not really supposed to use your imagination, or at least you're not supposed to say that you're using your imagination. And really what Minecraft and playing and rebuilding, recrafting the past in Minecraft with a lot of people, most of them being kids, with a lot of imagination, allowed us to do is to really sort of work with uh, a co-creative view, so creating this past together. Yeah. So in a way, you could say that our project, uh, Rome Minecraft, was very much about democratizing knowledge about the past, about sharing with others the stuff that we, as a, the kind of knowledge that we as academics have. Y yes, through play, right? Because mm -hmm. that was really the point of it. For example, one of the things that happened in this uh, was that um, a bunch of people put uh, polar bears in a yes. Roman fort, <laughs> right? And we, we rolled with that. So there were also people that participated that we don't want polar bears in our fort. And we said, okay, so let's talk about it. Why not, right? Yes. And that is a good example of how playing with the past doesn't always have to be factual, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to have really have happened. There were newsflash, no Roman polar bears, <laughs> or maybe Roman polar bears, not in the Netherlands. No, not in the Netherlands. <laughs> as far as we know, yeah. no Roman polar bears in the Netherlands. But you get to work with that. And um, really, Minecraft is really good as a game like that. Mm -hmm. But there are many more games that allow you to be creative with them, right? So, for example, we, you, in fact, saw 
Um, what did you say about Fortnite? Well, that Fortnite is going to have an ancient uh, Egypt map coming coming up in its game. Right, and there's a whole uh, sort of scenario builder in there that you, mm -hmm. which is already active, but you yep. can actually build your own environments in Fortnite, which is now much more than just a shooting game, right? It's this, well, it's this people call it a metaverse, this, yep. this place where you get to be and have all sorts of experiences. And in that sense, there is a kind of a, an open future mm -hmm. for, um, for all sorts of games, but particularly of recreations of the past coming up. I think we've all familiar with the idea of AI, right? Artificial intelligence. And that more and more these artificial intelligence allow us to create new things. Mm -hmm. One of the end games, for example, for Midjourney, which is a very popular generative art AI developing team company, mm -hmm. um, is to have interactive environments. The idea literally yep. is that you can play your dreams. And those dreams can very well be dreams about the past. Okay, but that sounds a bit like a, a wild future. We've been hearing a lot about the, the dangers of AI when it comes to art, the dangers of AI when it comes to text. Uh, here you're telling us that it's going to be about knowledge sharing, which sounds like a very positive thing, but the, are there also some dangers attached to it? And should we be concerned as stewards of the past? Yeah, this is a really good question. I think it we, we can be concerned all we want, but mm -hmm. in a way it's out of our hands that part of it, right? We are not in the AI, AI development scene or we're not legislators that get to work with that. Mm -hmm. So the best that we can do here, and that's something we've been doing already for a long time, and we should keep on doing that, is to really get out there. Yep. To get out there to those people that are excited about building, I don't know, Stonehenge in Fortnite, or maybe the Leidenburg in Fortnite, or any of the other weird things that may happen in terms of our ease of access to yep. tools, to game making tools get out there, we talk to them, we share our passion and knowledge of the past, and that hopefully will allow us to have even better playful game changers in the future. So what you're saying is that the revolution is out there, it's happening, and we need to also get out there and participate in yes, it. Yes, absolutely. So, that's it. These are the game changers of antiquity. Well, there could have been a lot more. We didn't talk about Legionnaire, the first game that lets you be Caesar, and one of the first real-time strategy games. Or Spiritfarer, where you get to take on the role of Haron, the ferryman of the dead, and take care of your loved ones that passed away. We also didn't talk about the fact that Dungeons & Dragons is rooted in both the mythological world of Tolkien and ancient historical wargaming. Or about how we played in the past and what can we learn about that through playing in the present. Right. Basically, there are so many crossroads at intersections of games in the past that we will be exploring this for a long time to come. One big takeaway from all of this is that these games are culture and many of them are quickly becoming heritage themselves. That doesn't mean that new ones are less interesting because like any good history, they can and will change our perspectives on the past. Absolutely. And on the other hand, it's also good to remember that these games come with their own perspectives. And sometimes these are very old-fashioned ones, such as the big question of what it means to be civilized. And what or which pasts we can play in games and which not. There's a lot of room for new games and new pasts here. Yeah, we got to remember that when we play with the past, the past also plays with us. That's a fun thought to take away from this. Thank you very much for watching. And we're always happy to hear from you. Don't hesitate to reach out with comments and questions. I wonder what other people's game changers are. It could be Rome Total War. Or Imperator Rome. Or it could be Pharaoh. Or it could be one of the Caesar games. Or it could be Settlers. It could be the Settlers of Catan. Or the Seven Wonders board game. Absolutely. It could be Rise, Son of Rome. Or it could be Age of Empires. <laughs>